everybody. Welcome to the 2021 International E-Conference on Religious Trauma. My name is Dr. Darren Slade, and I'm the president of the Global Center for Religious Research, which is hosting this year's academic conference. Now, one of the great things about GCRR is that you're being joined by students, scholars, and specialists from all over the world, right from the comfort and safety of your own home. Now, something significant to note is that the Global Center for Religious Research has established the world's very first and most comprehensive psychiatric research group to study the causes, manifestations, and treatment options for those suffering from religious trauma. And GCRR has actually built a team of approximately 30 psychiatrists, therapists, uh, sociologists, university professors, religion scholars, and PhD candidates from all over the world, all who specialize in the field of trauma research. Now, if you are a specialist and would like to join this international team, just reach out to GCRR through our website and we can give you more information there. But we do have to address one big problem. And that is in order for victims of religious trauma to receive help, we need to arrive at a place in our culture where religious trauma is accepted as a real condition. Unfortunately, the academic study of religious trauma remains in its infancy, especially when compared to other studies in mental health. Sadly, this means that there really are no exhaustive empirical studies to support uh, what we've all experienced in the tens of thousands, which is that religious trauma exists and that it is a chronic problem within many religions. And as it stands, really only anecdotal case studies have been published so far, but nothing substantially empirical to actually prove it exists. So GCRR is intending to correct this gap of knowledge, and we would like to get your help with this. So we just recently set up a GoFundMe page in order to crowdsource uh, the world's very first comprehensive empirical study on religious trauma. We want to conduct a massive sociological study on those traumatized by religion in the hopes of providing the foundational data necessary to educate and hopefully prevent religious trauma from occurring in the future. And you may be asking, why are we crowdsourcing this on GoFundMe? The sad fact is that all federal funding for mental health research has come to a screeching halt. And so we have to turn to the public for help right now. So uh, rest assured, any and all donations that you give to this would go exclusively just to the funding this study and any amount that you could give would be extremely helpful. Uh, all you have to do is go to GoFundMe.com and then look for the Religious Trauma Sociological Study. And at the very least, please share this GoFundMe page across all your social media platforms so we can get the word out about this very important research project. And with that said, I have the great pleasure of being able to introduce my friend and our next presenter, Reverend Erica Allison. All right. Rev Erica is going to be talking about Gay the Pray Away, Uncovering the Long-Term Impacts of Religious Trauma and Conversion Therapy. Now, Rev Erica is a queer interfaith minister, spiritual counselor, author, and workshop leader. She helps people find spiritual liberation, restore belonging, and heal from identity harm. Uh, Rev Erica is the author of Gay the Pray Away, Healing Your Life, Love, and Relationships from the Harms of LGBT Conversion Therapy, and she leads a monthly queer spiritual gathering called Gay the Pray. She is a frequent podcast guest and guest speaker for queer affirming religious and spiritual centers and events, and Rev. Erica was recently named to Queer and C's 100 Women List, celebrating LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs, leaders, and creators. So it's such a distinct and honor and privilege to be able to introduce her and have her here with us. So I will turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Darren. And thank you, everyone. Um, I don't know what time it is where you are, but where I am on the East Coast of the US, it is 11 p.m. So thanks to those who are doing the night shift along with me. I hope you have your milk and cookies, uh, your vegan, vegan milk and cookies and are enjoying an, an evening snack. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. I'm uh, super happy to be with you tonight. And I just wanna take you through what we're gonna chat about here. 
So as Darren said, my topic is called Gay the Pray Away, and we're going to be focusing in on the religious trauma of conversion therapy, because what is a conference on religious trauma if somebody doesn't talk about conversion therapy? So I'm going to be the one who does that. I'm I know a few of my colleagues have also mentioned it as part of their talks, but I'm going to be focusing in on this today. Um, as Rev Darren, uh, as Darren said, my name is Erica, and I, um, I'm actually a mechanical engineer by background and spent a lot of my career in the education sector um, after dropping out of the corporate world for a while. So I do have a, a master's degree in education. And, um, and then I did become an interfaith uh, minister, which is, I, if you don't know, an interfaith minister basically is looking at all the different religion, tradi religious traditions and finding the way that those point towards one common source or finding the deeper truths that exist within each of these other structures. So that's the kind of minister that I am. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in the talk. So the way this is going to work, I'm going to spend about 30 minutes, maybe a little less even, uh, chatting with you through the, through the context of this presentation. Um, we're going to talk briefly about this overall category of religious trauma, but then we're going to drop into conversion therapy and um, a topic or a, a theme that I call identity harm. And I'll describe what I mean by identity harm. Uh, where I really want to focus is on the long-term impacts of this sort of trauma. And um, the reason for that is there's a lot of research that I will show you some stats on um, a lot of what's out there on the shorter term or basically what happens in the moment with, with people who've experienced this. Um, I have a perspective of being able to look at it over a 20 year course of, of history. And so looking at how these things continue to show up, what some of these longer term impacts are in life is, um, is what a majority of my focus will be. And then I do want to offer something towards the end called the rainbow path, which is just a framework that I've come up with as part of my, my own personal journey and others that I've been kind of working with and helping to guide through their own healing journeys. That is what I hope can be my contribution to this space and to the healing of, uh, of this type of religious trauma. So we'll go through in very high level, um, high level look at what the rainbow path is. And then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. So please take some notes. Um, if, you, if there's something you wanna chat about in more detail, we'll have time for that at the end. And uh, Darren will do his, his expertise of facilitating the Q&A at the end. So I might just start with a little bit of an overview of, um, of conversion therapy. And I wanna do this in the context of religious trauma. So, um, you know, first of all, actually I'm gonna go back for a moment because first of all, with religious trauma, there's something interesting about this and a few other speakers have talked about it. Um, I was really, uh, really relating with Craig and Paula on the last talk. The thing about religious trauma, and I'm sure I don't have to say this to many of you, it's, it's insidious because it's the last place we would expect to find trauma. You know, like people go into religious institutions in many cases, um, it's, it's a place of safety and security. It might be a place of inspiration. It might be a place where you, you kind of came of age and, and grew up and got a lot of your developmental um, shaping. And so for that to be a place that kind of surprises you with a traumatic experience, um, it tends to make, you know, like if I were walking down a dark alley and something traumatic happened to me, I might be expecting that a little bit more because that's, you know, I had, my, I might have my, my defenses up because that would seem like an unsafe place to be and I'm, I would need to be bracing for that. But there's something about the religious trauma that um, it kind of catches you unaware. And I believe that that is part of what makes it challenging. So we'll go into that. Um, but I wanna go right into conversion therapy and I wanna go into it because I myself am a survivor of conversion therapy. And I wanna tell you a little bit about my story um, before we talk about some of the statistics related to conversion therapy. So my story is that um, I grew up in Texas and I grew up in the um, Missouri Senate Lutheran Church. It was pretty much the community that I knew um, in Texas, uh, at least the part of Texas I grew up in. You are, you're an athlete and, you're, and you go to church. Those are the things that we all kind of did. And there's a very homogeneous uh, look at things in, that, in the way that I grew up in the suburbs of Dallas where I grew up. So my community was my church. A lot of the people that I played sports with, I went to church with and vice versa. And, um, and that was what I knew. I also really enjoyed being um, well liked, especially by the adults. That was something that I kind of prided myself in being was, um, you know, the good, one of the good kids. Um, I kind of kept myself out of trouble and I, I studied hard and liked to excel. 
Um, and so something really interesting happened when in high school, I started to discover my sexuality. I started to, I, to discover that I was attracted to women. And as soon as I had that realization, a lot of dots connected in my, in my life. Um, you know, I had been really drawn to some of my coaches growing up and never knew why that was, but I always felt like a kinship with them. And as I looked back at them from this new lens of like, oh, right, I am a lesbian, I started to notice like, oh, they're all lesbians too. They're just extremely closeted because of the place where we live. It's not safe for them to be out. So it was, um, it put a lot of, it made, made things make sense for me in a lot of ways. But this was the late 90s. And I was also very aware, um, being in a conservative Christian household, that this wasn't an acceptable thing to be. Um, pastors were giving sermons about how this was out of alignment with God's plan. And, um, you know, it was right around the time Matthew Shepard was murdered. If you, if you don't know 1998, Matthew Shepard was a young man, young gay man who um, was murdered as part of a hate crime in Wyoming. So that was going on right around this time that I was also grappling with my own sexuality. And the other thing going on was religious organizations like Focus on the Family uh, were, and, and the Westboro Baptist Church were really coming out politically, um, vocally against homosexuality. Um, you might see, you might have seen some of the pictures of the, the awful signs that were like, um, that people were protesting at people's funerals and the, the whole God hates fags signs that they would be um, holding outside of uh, either pride parades and even really inappropriate places like funeral services. So there was a lot of that, a lot of that was up and the churches had decided in, in many cases, some of the churches, and some of the religious institutions had decided to take a stand on this issue, a stand in terms of family values, and really came, came out um, making this an issue. And it became a very divisive is issue in churches, as it still is today. We, we'll talk more about that. Um, in my personal example, or my personal case, um, my family found out that I was gay. I did not come out to them. <laughs> they discovered it. And when they discovered it, we had to have a talk because it was it was shocking to them and it wasn't something they were really prepared to deal with. So the first talk we had with uh, was just my parents and I. And I remember they sat me down in the kitchen and they they said, you know, we we found some chat rooms you were in on the computer and you know we have to ask you, are you are you are you gay? Are you homosexual? Like what's what is going on? And I remember just thinking for a moment, like, oh man, how is this going to go down? I, I was terrified. I was really terrified. And I was kind of reading them to see like, is, is this going to be a accepting conversation, a condemning conversation? What is this going to be? And, you know, my dad broke the ice first and he said, you know, Erica, if you are, can we just, can we talk about this? Like, let, let, just tell us so that we can have a conversation. And so I paused for a second thinking like, okay, maybe there's an opening here now. Uh, and then my mom swooped right in and said, Rick, what are you talking about? If she is, we're sending her away to live with her aunt. We have to get her out of this environment. We have to get her out of here. Um, she has to be uh, removed from these influences. So it was very clear in that moment that this was not, not going to go super well. So my, my response was just a way of not lying, but also not, um, I wasn't ready yet to completely come out of the closet. So I said, I don't know. I'm confused. Um, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm struggling with this. So the next step was to go to, go to church and go to the pastor and to talk with the pastor about, about this situation. So we had a, a talk, my parents and the pastor and myself, and um, the pastor made it really clear what the Bible has to say about this from, from his perspective, of course, um, and just that this was not in line with God's teachings. This was not in line with who I wanted to be. I'm a good kid. Why would, why would I choose something like this? This we, we, you need, I need to get help. That was really, it was, I need to get help. And as I said before, setting up the story, I did like to please adults. And I do, I did want to, you know, I had always been the good kid. And so in this moment, all of a sudden I'm sitting here, like I'm in trouble and it felt awful. And uh, I didn't know what that was about. So I, I went along with what they suggested, which was they knew of a place where I could get some help. I could get some, um, I could talk to some therapists who could maybe help clear this up for me. <laughs> so um, I went to what is considered conversion therapy. And conversion therapy is basically practices um, that are attempting to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. And these practices are, they can be different. Um, there are many different types of conversion therapy. In my experience, it was religious-based and it was with a one-on-one -on -one counselor, not my pastor, a separate side counselor. And there was also a group 
portion of what I went to. Um, it was not residential. Mine was kind of, I would go once a week to this, to this place where this thing would happen. And um, in the group sessions, we were truly praying the gay away. I mean, there was a lot of, if you've heard that term, pray the gay away, that was, that was happening. There were, we were praying for Jesus to take this, um, this sin from us, to, to, to free us from this bondage. And then in the one-on-one -on -one sessions, it really was a lot of finding places in my life through talk therapy where I was sad, where I was afraid, where I was depressed or anxious. And if, if I expressed any of those situations as we were digging for them, um, it was using those as evidence, evidence that I was out of alignment with God's plan for my life. So there are a lot of things that came out of this that we'll talk about in the longer term impacts, but the approach in my experience was really one of find, find places of weakness and use those to say, look, you don't want this. If you don't want this, you need to get back on this, on this path. And, you know, the saddest part of the experience for me was that there was a moment in time where I did, um, I did I did surrender to this. I did say yes to what they were teaching me. Um, it was, I was about to go off to college and I, I felt like, you know, so many people are upset about this. My, it's, it's upsetting my entire church. It's upsetting my family. I, it's not, it's not worth it. I mean, this is, and, and I even said to my mom, these exact words, I said, you know, Jesus sacrificed his life for me. This is, this is the sacrifice that, that I'm going to make for Jesus. And I was sobbing and I just felt like in that moment, I really, I abandoned myself. I had had, I had had kind of my family abandoning me is how it felt and the church abandoning me, but I hadn't yet abandoned myself. But in that moment, I said, I just, I want everyone else to be happy. I want to go back to being that kid that is good, that everybody loves, that, that is included. And I am willing to make the sacrifice if that's what it takes. And so I went off to college um, with this new desire to be straight and I tried to do all the things that straight people do and it was um it was a bit of a fail let's put it that way um I was not I was not good at that it was very out of alignment for me and um the biggest the, the kind of the funniest and awkwardest moment I have to share with you um I did try to have a boyfriend and I we kissed each other once <laughs> and I actually no joke we both vomited in the bushes. <laughs> he vomited in the bushes because he was drunk. <laughs> I vomited in the bushes because it just felt so out of alignment with who I was <laughs> in my life. So um, I, I, that was just my saving grace. And, and I, you know, I have to say this in true honesty. I don't know what would have happened life trajectory wise if, if this intervention hadn't happened. But I walked down the street in Austin, Texas. Thankfully, I went to school in Austin, a little more liberal place. I walked down the street and I saw a church that was a Lutheran church that had a gay flag outside. And it was in that moment, I was just like, wait, what? How is this possible? I just went through this whole thing that explained to me that these two things could not coexist. So you tell me, how is this possible? I walked right into the church and I said, I need to talk to the pastor here because what is going on? And it was, it was interesting because the pastor was not overly like, oh, you're queer, we love you, we embrace you. Instead, the pastor just said, you know, we don't know. This is a very... It's a confusing issue. We don't know, but what, because we don't know, we're taking the tact as a church of accepting and including rather than um, pushing away. And in that moment, I just felt like, you know what? These people don't know more than me. They, they are not, they don't have more authority than me to determine what God has to say about me and what's right for myself. So it really made me in that moment, just it took religious authority down a peg on the pedestal for me. And it was the liberation that I needed actually to go into my own thinking rather than letting another group of people think for me and tell me what, what was God's intentions. It, it forced me into a place where I needed to start asking these things. And um, it really was the beginning for me of finding my own way and finding my own self. So when, when I talk about, I want to pause in that, on that moment and pause on that part of the story for a second, because I do want to tell you that conversion therapy is actually still a thing. Sometimes people think, oh, that was a thing in the past. That was years ago. For me, it was over 20 years ago when it happened. Um, but there are some statistics now that I do want to share with people just so everyone is educated on this particular topic. 
Uh, the first thing I want to point out is all of the logos on the right are all organizations that have some something to say about conversion therapy um, with statistics or quotes or summaries, synopses of the history of conversion therapy. So if you were to type in any of these logos and just say like Trevor Project Conversion Therapy or GLAD Conversion Therapy, you can find a lot of great resources on, um, on this topic that you can read more for yourself. What I've done on the left side is just pulled out what I think are probably the, the highlights. One of the highlights is over 700,000 adults have received conversion therapy. It's actually over 700,000 people have received conversion therapy and half of those were, ex were subjected to that at 18 or below. I was actually 18 years old when I experienced it. So there are about half of the people who go through this are minors when it comes to their age. According to the Trevor Project, um, who, and the Trevor Project is an organization that responds to LGBTQ suicide calls. Um, they're right on the front lines of suicide prevention and more, they've had more than 1.8 million LGBTQ youth in the US seriously consider, consider suicide based on some research that they've done. So that's a huge number. And then they also made a quote that few practices hurt LGBTQ youth more than attempts to change their sexual orientation or gender identity. The most exciting research that's come out of this that I also wanna share with you is from a group called the Family Acceptance Project. And that is a group out of San Francisco State. What they wanted to look at was the intersection of family acceptance and LGBTQ youth. And what they found was very staggering. What they found was that youth who had, who were put into conversion therapy or some had some kind of an alternative experience because of um, their sexuality. These over on the left are some of the, the pretty scary statistics that come out of this. More than, they're more than eight times as likely to have attempted suicide. So youth who have gone through conversion therapy are more than eight times as likely to have attempted suicide. Uh, they're nearly six times as likely to report high levels of depression, more than three times likely to use illegal drugs, and more than three times uh, likely to be at risk, high risk for STDs, risky sexual behavior, HIV, other things like that. So the, the research is pretty staggering when it comes to this. Um, and the last piece I, I do wanna share with you is that uh, over the, the ones who do survive, there's still a 92% greater odds of having lifetime suicidal ideation. So there is some long-term effects on this that we're about to get into. There's a research piece I wanna point out to you because this is a, a religious conference and I wanna bring it into the religious side of things now. So there's a great new research study that just came out of Australia, literally just this February, 2001, 2021. And it's called uh, Healing Spiritual Harms. And it talks about, they did a research study of youth who had been through conversion therapy and the practitioners who work with them. And it was an entire lit review of everything that's out there. And then they did their own firsthand research as well. So I highly recommend that if anybody, I know we have a lot of therapists in the room, if anybody's working in this field and working with youth who have experienced this, definitely grab a copy of this article. It's free online, you can find it. What they found was that there are these seven support needs. Oh.